Okay, I think we are on. Yes, good evening and welcome everyone. And I see that more people are joining, so I will start speaking a little slowly. Uh, we will start our session very shortly. Um, if someone in the audience could uh, let us know if you can uh, hear me and if you can see the uh, front page of uh, the presentation. So I see some nods. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Okay, so here we go. My name is Eduardo Lima. I am a faculty lecturer and academic program coordinator at the McGill School of Continuing Studies. Welcome, bienvenue, seko, tansi, tungasugit. Today we are gathered in Teotiage, also known as Montreal, the traditional territory of indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. McGill honors recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters from which we host today's event in the spirit of the longhouse or gathering place that used to bring people from all over together in Kanyenka Haka. Welcome to webinar, The Future of Finance, From Cryptocurrencies to Responsible Investing. Before we start, I'd like to share a few tips for you to better enjoy the session. Uh, if you have a VPN connection, please disconnect from VPN and close any unnecessary applications. By default, your microphone has been muted. Please ask your questions using the chat function and we will address them during the Q&A period. And please note that the session is being recorded. So um, I'll continue introducing the panelists. I will start introducing myself. As I said, I am Eduardo Lim, a faculty lecturer an academic program coordinator in the School of Continuing Studies at McGill University. I'm responsible for developing the finance programming at the school, including the Diploma in Professional Practice in Finance and the McGill CFA workshop. Before joining McGill in 2018, I had a 17 year career as a consultant with pension plans and other institutional investors, having worked for Towers Perrin, Mercer, Eckler, and Murnau Chappelle. I hold an MBA in finance from McGill University and a PhD in physics from the University of Pennsylvania. And I am a CFA charter holder. With me to this evening, I have um, a few folks that I will be introducing uh, one by one. I will start with Bina, Bina Lenz. Uh, she's a principal economist in the FinTech Policy and Research Division, FPRD, within the Financial Stability Department of the Bank of Canada. Her areas of focus are cryptocurrencies, um, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, and fintech more broadly, and how these innovations could impact the financial system. Prior to joining the bank, Bina worked in Goldman Sachs London Corporate Treasury Department and within the startup sector. Bina holds an LLM in Law and Economics from Queen Mary University of London as well as a Master's in Science in Economics from Université de Montréal and a BCom from McGill University, also a McGillian. Um, I will introduce now uh, Jonathan Lepin. Uh, Jonathan holds an MBA in Finance from Laval University. He also obtained his um, CPA, Chartered Professional Accountant designation, and also a CFA charter holder. He is one of the founding members of the CFA Montreal FinTech Committee, which was launched in 2017. Jonathan, Jonathan dedicated the last 12 years working in the financial industry, successively assuming the roles of 
gatekeeper in the exempt market, wealth management auditor, compliance supervisor dedicated to financial derivatives and structured products and new products distribution, such as cryptocurrency funds. Jonathan has more recently joined the wealth management solutions team at the National Bank Financial, where he acts as senior advisor to the uh, lead portfolio manager in that wealth management division of uh, National Bank Financial. And finally, I will introduce you to Karina Riviello. Karina is the head of university relations at FinTech Cadence, a Canadian incubator who's dedicated to supporting early stage FinTech entrepreneurs. Her present role is to establish a strong relationship between the academic sector and the FinTech industry. Karina lives by the motto, Jill of all trades. In her past life, she has worked as a plant biologist, a cafe manager, and an events coordinator. So she's very used to different ecosystems. She discovered the exciting world of startups a few years ago and has been devoted to its community ever since. Before joining FinTech Cadence, Karina has worked at Notman House, one of Montreal's famous tech hubs, where she has supported its community of entrepreneurs from all tech sectors. So join me in, in welcoming this uh, very impressive panel. Um, and right now, I guess I'll we'll put this in presentation mode. And I um, essentially uh, shared all the information about the panelists and you can now appreciate uh, their pictures. Bina, Jonathan, and Karina. And now we can move on to the panel questions. So uh, we can take a quick look at all the questions. And uh, I'll just start by saying a few remarks about the topics of today's discussion. Uh, we want, we have a very ambitious um, task, which is to discuss the future of finance, such a broad um, sector of um, economic activity, if you will. And uh, it includes many industries, as you know. Um, and so uh, we decided to focus on such things as cryptocurrencies and responsible investing to represent the fact that in today's world, uh, the um, most important areas of growth in uh, in finance are represented in the fintech sector and in um, ESG investing, if you will, or responsible investing. So these are the, the, the two biggest trends in general in finance today. And uh, there is a very objective measure of this importance. And you can just look at the assets under management uh, of funds that dedicate to such types of assets. So if you think about the fintech companies and their stock, if you think about other assets that are associated with fintech, such as crypto, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, and look at the growth of, um, of activity in terms of trading uh, these assets and the uh, total uh, assets under management by um, institutional funds, you see how uh, the growth has taken place in such a short time. And therefore, these are the directions that should be looked at. And that's why we see, uh, you know, people are working on this, um, on, on this area and the panelists who are here today uh, have been looking at this for quite some time now, and um, you know I can't wait to just, just uh, have them start sharing their views. So without further ado, uh, let's start with the first question: Which fintech sectors have the most potential for growth in the next five and next ten years? And uh, perhaps I will uh, just get uh, started with Bina. Well, hi Eduardo. Thank you for having me today. Um, well, before I share my views, I'll just say that these are my personal views only. They do not reflect any views or position of the Bank of Canada. Um, so with that, um, of course, uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but if I think about what the private sector often does is that uh, they look at services that already exist and they look for opportunities to improve them. And the opportunities can often be found where fees are high, perhaps due to low competition, and processes are slow or cumbersome. Um, and one of those areas in the financial system is payments. So really across the payment spectrum, wholesale, retail, front end, back end, uh, cross border specifically, uh, it's very expensive. 
multiple steps, lots of middlemen, and can be very slow. And so there's a lot of opportunity there. And because of that, firms have really started investing, trying to develop new products. We saw Facebook launch a pilot wallet called Novi in the fall, which will use a stable coin called Paxos. We see Visa working with USCC, one of the biggest stable coins, to also come up with new payment solutions. So as those uh, products move from the testing phase to being actually rolled out in the market, um, with such, I think, big factors, we're going to start to see a lot of adoption and growth um, in new payment methods. Yes, very interesting. Uh, thank you, Bina. Um, any other re reactions from uh, the other panelists, Jonathan? Um, to m for myself, I think uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, have a lot of room to grow. Uh, there has been a lot of project. Uh, there is uh, some uh, endeavor that went further, but uh, for a big organization, sometimes the data is a bit messy. And before uh, getting into a AI project, sometimes you have to do some data cleansing. So to organize your data in order to be able to better manage and uh, uh, achieve better uh, result with your uh, AI project. There's also tokenization uh, beside NFT and uh, crypto arts. I think there's a lot of potential in the financial industry uh, for all the recognition of the uh, ownership of uh, of uh, any uh, investment or uh, uh, buildings or so there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting project that could uh, derive from tokenization and uh, only to mention a few others regtech insurtech all project that could uh, be very helpful for those uh, industry and uh, not to mention the blockchain which could have some major impact in financial uh, institution the settlement the exchange of money uh, just like uh, bena was referring to so i'll stop here but uh, plenty of innovation that could uh, lead to promising uh, new project in the futures I would totally agree with uh, both what Bina and Jonathan say. I do have a few other sectors I think we're looking at that I think will be very uh, growing very fast in, in the upcoming years. Jonathan mentioned InsureTech. It's something that fin at FinTech Cadence we've been looking at for quite some time. Uh, insurance is very cumbersome. It's a lot of paperwork, very hard to understand for many people. So we're, and I, and I think for financial institutions, it's something that they're all, most of them are offering also services in insurance. And it's something that, we are waiting to see, and we're pretty sure that it's going to evolve quickly in, in the upcoming years. So that's something to keep our eye out, eyes out. Prop tech, also property technology, uh, is uh, often a sector that we forget, and that is part of fintech. Um, with the housing market that's that's growing and going in a bubble right now, uh, there's there's a lot to do. A lot of people that want to invest, so uh, technologies that can help with investing, uh, buying your mortgage. We have a whole bunch of uh, startups that are focused around that. Building your credit score, also a big part of of prop tech. So like these these innovations are are growing. Just to say, like in the last years, uh, from startups that would apply to our incubator to today, we've like it's doubled in, in terms of prop tech. So it's not going to stop. It's really going to continue. And last but not least, I really think a sector that is going to continue growing a lot in the upcoming years is cybersecurity. Um, COVID hit hard, and and it changed a lot of things in in our world. Uh, we went from a semi digitalized world to a very digitalized world in a very short period of time. Clearly, that comes with some downsides. Uh, more and more people are seeing this as an opportunity to uh, steal money in in any ways. Um, so clearly, new cybersecurity uh, solutions will be needed. There's already a lot happening in cybersecurity, but clearly financial institutions have a lot of money to invest in cybersecurity. It's their main focus at the at the moment, I think. Um, and where the money goes, well, innovation grows. So we're expecting that to uh, to to move a lot in the upcoming years. Wow, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I think you guys uh, shot from all directions, and I think you've covered everything. Uh, and I also liked uh, your, you know, your different uh, approaches and uh, modes of thinking, uh, which uh, make a lot of sense. 
Um, so without further ado, let's uh, continue to the second question. We have a few questions that are very interesting and it would be nice to uh, try to cover all of or almost all of them. Uh, second, what are the main challenges for fintech entrepreneurs and how can they overcome them? And here we're talking about entrepreneurs. I can't help but think about Karina first, but I know that, uh, you know, maybe Jonathan and, and uh, perhaps even Bina could talk about it. But uh, what, what do you think? Happy to jump in first, uh, if you guys are okay with that. Um, there's many things that's really hard for entrepreneurs and no matter the sector you're in, entrepreneurs, uh, they have a lot of challenges, but I think the FinTech sector is a particular one, uh, especially in Canada. First of all, we have a very strong uh, financial focus, like bank focused uh, economy in Canada. We have those big fives that kind of own like most of the market. So for any starting companies, it's very difficult to own that market. And also let's not remember, let's not forget that the Canadian market is very small compared to other markets. Um, and, and so to speak, it's, it's, it's harder to, to gain traction on a small market. So that's why a lot of companies do tend to, to focus more on US. Um, also, I think, uh, regulations is a very strong pain point for certain, uh, companies that do come in Canada. Regulations are very strict. Uh, I mean, we still don't have clear regulations around open banking. It's been a while that that we have a discussions with that. We're still hoping it's, it's going to come. I think the new conversations are, are focused around January 2023, but my last, uh, I remember when we used to say it would be uh, January 2019. So we'll, we'll believe it when we'll see it. Um, but for certain companies, it's, it's very hard. Uh, just take an example, Revolut was a UK company that wanted to come in Canada and they couldn't offer most of their services, so they ended up leaving. Um, I think regulation was the major pain point there. Um, so, yeah, and uh, last, maybe, but not least, uh, we have a lot of B2B companies. So companies that do work directly with financial institutions or bigger corporations, they're one of their major difficulties. I say, I think for them is, uh, when they want to work with FIs, they have very, very strong, um, targets of compliance and security to attain, to really work with these FIs. And when you're a small business, it's, it's hard to attain the, the. The compliance of, of those big financial institutions. So it's a really, it's, it's really hard for B2B companies in that sense. Um, I think to overcome that a lot of our companies, we really, really, we tell them all the time that they really need to focus with security from the get go when they're building their product. But it's, uh, it's still a major pain point, I think, for, for a lot of fintech entrepreneurs. Interesting. Thank you. Jonathan, maybe? Uh, what I could say, I'll stay brief, but uh, stay humble. Acknowledge that you won't change the financial industry overnight. Uh, try to work in cooperation with the current player. It will be a lot more, uh, uh, you, you will have a lot more chance of success by this way. And uh, as uh, Karina was saying, uh, regulatory uh, requirements are a given in the financial industry. So to, from the get go, integrate those, uh, those uh, special uh, features in your solutions to address the compliance issues. Interesting. I imagine too that understanding the product because an innovator will come up with these different ideas and um and and they you know they will want to test these ideas but sometimes you know they when they start lean and maybe you know understand as you go and figure it out as you go but uh i think an effort uh, to, uh towards understanding uh the product and developing the product uh may be an interesting challenge as well that uh poses itself to these entrepreneurs and also take into consider consideration to um to to have some solution that are scalable because when you uh, get uh, uh, an agreement with a major financial institution, volume can can come very quickly. True. Yes. Um, okay. Well, if any, in, uh, no more comments on this one. We can move to the next question. Uh, 
uh, moving a little bit uh, from fintech and towards this other uh, mainstream of attention in the financial world, ESG. Uh, so let's just start with an introductory question. Why and how these uh, ESG factors uh, become such a driving force in the world of finance? So we could start talking about this one. I'll let you. I could maybe jump in at first. You yes. allow me. Uh, so ESG is not a new concept. Uh, we must realize that over decades, uh, there were a lot of uh, a flavor that came. In the 50s, 60s, it started with the electrical and mine working workers unions that uh, uh, attributed their pension capital towards uh, affordable housing and health facil uh, facilities. Uh, in the 60s, with all the anti-war uh, protests, there was some uh, chemical companies that were targeted by students and protesters. So over the years, each uh, decade, we saw a, refi uh, a, a new angle of the ESG. Um, why now, um, as um, Larry Flink, the CMO, the CEO from BlackRock uh, said in his annual letter to shareholders in 2021, the time is to hack is now. Uh, the, 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 the event of COVID, uh, the people to realize that the business community can and should play a role in creating a better world. Uh, you cannot deny anymore uh, climate change. Uh, the, the movement is growing. Uh, uh, bigger and bigger. A lot of uh, major financial institution now requires uh, their portfolio manager to join the uh, PRI, PRI, a United Nation uh, Support Initiative to uh, to support six principles in order to better manage your fund. And the whole industry, uh, National Bank Investment is one of them. We now require from every portfolio manager to to examine the ESG within their framework of evaluation. And the last quarter, there was some special subset of question that was sent to every portfolio manager with, with whom we deal. So the industry is, is moving and moving fast. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a ball that, that start rolling a long time ago, but is getting bigger and bigger and uh, you cannot ignore it anymore if you want to succeed in the industry. Very interesting. I can't help, I couldn't help but to think of almost like, I think it's the physicist in me and I'm sure that Karina will also have a vision, a similar vision, which is uh, our planet is, uh, you know, the size of the planet is not growing. Right? The, the resources available are not necessarily growing that much, but we uh, are growing. Our civilizations are developing and uh, at a higher and higher speed. And, and the planet is reacting back to this, uh, to this force. And the, you know, part of that reaction is ESG investing, right? And uh, technology is one of the things that we use in this growth. And, and so here we are talking about technology and, uh, and these environmental uh, issues. But this is really like the reality that we see around us. And, and so finance is very much about this reality. Any other comments on this question? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I actually, I do agree with 100% with uh, what Jonathan and, and you're saying, Eduardo. I do also think that consumers kind of change. I see it from the other way around, not necessarily from the banking perspective, but like consumer driving the force also of, of the last years, because we did see a a bigger craze in the last years. And I think that COVID accelerated. Yes, I think people realize how uh, environmental issues are very close to us. But I also think that uh, it's it's an interesting analyze, but a lot of, a lot of people that are more focused on sociology are, are seeing this, but with COVID, there was a lot of boomers that retired and millennials kind of took in the workforce. And now there are the driving force of, of, there are the major workforce at the present moment. They are outnumbering Gen X, always did, but uh, more so than ever. and these are generations that are very that have it really at heart have, have been learning about climate crisis for all their life uh I rem i'm a millennial uh, so i can i can speak to that like i was 12 years old uh, in my class and we would talk about climate crisis so 20 years now that money is is flowing into this generation i think uh, people are voting with their money more and more and they're forcing that change onto uh corporations so that's why they're 
more and more including ESG as, as their driving factors. But I think you've also mentioned that something that's very important is more access to data. Uh, we can actually uh, see the impact with data and because of that, people can actually choose what they're uh, buying and what they're investing in. So data definitely is uh, uh, one of the driving forces of uh, ESG in the recent years. And maybe I can add a last point on that. Um, there is more and more women who are also investing more than ever. And it's also, there is proof that women tend to invest more in social and environmental issues, which also comes to say that uh, we need more diversity in finance in general. Absolutely. I'll that. <laughs> also, we must salute uh, the effort of a few organizations like the CFA Institute who rendered more um, research available uh, towards e ESG, the way of disclosing information for an organization. You cannot improve what you don't measure. So they, they, they are part of this big wheel that is turning and uh, hopefully will change uh, the way we, we we manage investment in the futures. It's true, and uh, there is a need for more and more uh, knowledge and education on uh, on you know obviously ESG concepts, uh, and 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 that's what we are. Uh, that, that's why we are here today too, is to bring out these uh, these issues. And uh, it's really a good point to recognize that CFA Institute is one of the uh, uh institutions th that are uh, pushing forward uh very strongly in this direction just as a, a reaction uh to the needs um uh, in the in the in the in the market uh very good um come, no, pushing it back towards uh fintech again and i promise that i will have some uh, questions direct uh directly uh to bina too uh but let's first uh look you know still looking at responsible investing in esg how is technology impacting that? So, um, I know besides, I think that just, the, and I think maybe I'm already, um, you know, removing a punchline, but I know that there is a lot of movement in terms of investments, right? The, uh, selecting investments and using data. So big data will be uh, an important issue. So it may be the most um, uh, immediate that comes to mind, but I'll let you guys explore that a little bit and maybe other applications. and. Uh, how we, we uh, are we seeing these uh, these two main streams in finance interacting with each other? Oh, well, if it... nobody wants, yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> um... Bon, big data, uh, you said it, Eduardo, uh, it's uh, uh, a key, I think, because when you talk about ESG, it's, it's, it isn't just a simple set of, uh, of measures or, of, or data. There's uh, plenty of information you can gather into, and it becomes quickly uh, unmanageable for humans. So the help of uh, machine and big data solutions is a key in order to be better able able to evaluate the performance of the uh, different uh, companies, and also maybe I think what has been maybe the major uh, issues for ESG is the lack of uh, of um, uh, common uh, evaluation about company. Is Tesla really a good ESG? Uh, company or not? Is an electrical car a good solution in Quebec? Maybe. Elsewhere, maybe not so much. Uh, so uh, I think the, the, there, as there is so many factors to take into consideration, technology will be an enabler that will help us figure all those uh, issues. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, with what Jonathan is saying. Um, big data AI has facilitated data collection, but also the pooling of data and, and those trends that we can actually uh, calculate real risk assessments. Um, I can't, like I'm not an, a tech expert, uh, I'll bait my uh, role at FinTech cadence, um, but we do have a few interesting companies that are actually working in ESG and it kind of illustrates how like uh, technology can kind of change uh, and really like impact responsible investing. 
I, we always like to take Aquantix as an example because it's one of our portfolio companies and, and they're a really cool Montreal company. Um, but for example, they use data like, and they use all sorts of data from scientific models and satellite data and even social media news and that they find. And then from there, they can evaluate risks and costs for real estates for any investors from small size investors to big size investors. For So for example, you're an investor, you wanna uh, buy a hotel in an area that you know uh, that can be flooded. Uh, well, because of uh, climate change issues, we're having more and more floods in that area. They can calculate the risk of, of those floods. How much will it cost? Uh, how will your insurance cost as uh, you have more and more floods? So these are the kinds of risk that they can uh, calculate for these specific uh, real estate investors. So yeah, these more and more tools exist. Uh, but as uh, Jonathan mentioned, one of the major, uh, I think, like. Uh, critiques of, of ESG uh, calculations is always like, how do we calculate our data? Is it like, is there is no like common ground on what are the specific criteria? And I think that's one of the, yeah, major issues. Yes, but I, I do like the idea of measuring risk because ultimately that has, you know, that can have a measurable and a definable impact on the value, the price of the assets, right? So ultimately, you are buying a stock of a company and you want to uh, for the company to to be you know ESG compliant and and so uh, you know uh, as the measurement system gets refined the, the you know you are essentially better pricing these assets very good uh, let me uh, move on to a question and I will uh, ask Bina to address this one which technology or fintech capability will have the greatest impact on the Canadian financial system, you know, looking from your perspective and the research you've been doing. Yeah, no, um, the two premier ones that my fellow panelists have already mentioned, um, I think uh, open banking and blockchain technology will really have um, a good impact. I hope so, at least. Uh, so if we look first at open banking, um, and for those who aren't aware, it's a framework and system that provides fintechs and other firms access to banking and transaction data via an API. So the result is that it improves cybersecurity and data privacy by ensuring that only the desired data is shared in a secure manner. Uh, but from an innovation perspective, it increases data mobility and access. And this could really lead to a lot of new innovative products and services, as well as increased competition. Um, so, there's a lot of potential here. Um, it's already underway in other jurisdictions. Um, as, as Karina mentioned, it's starting to come underway in Canada. The Department of Finance has um, acknowledged that this is important, has named a lead last month. Um, and so, hopefully, um, as it gets rolled out and goes live in the next few years, we'll really start to see uh, a lot of new companies, a lot of new services as those uh, barriers to entry are reduced. Um, and then if I turn quickly to blockchain technology, blockchain at the end of the day creates a really highly accessible foundational infrastructure on which financial and payment services can be really quickly and cheaply built relative to legacy systems. And so what this does, again, it reduces barriers to entry for firms, and it also allows for services to be developed for niche market segments that perhaps previously were not profitable. So I think both these innovative capabilities, frameworks, um, have a potential to make the financial system much more dynamic and where firms and individuals will really have greater choice of products and services that really meet their specific needs. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Bina. Any other reactions to this question? I 100% agree with all that Bina said. Uh, I think these are very two uh, areas of technology that clearly uh, have, have impacted already a lot. Uh, FinTech, open banking more in other countries, of course, uh, than in Canada. But uh, clearly, we'll see a lot of technologies, a lot of new innovations coming from those tech. AI, we've mentioned it also, uh, we, we often forget, but it's like such a big technology and it's so transversal to all fields. Uh, has has brought so many new techs. For example, yeah, a lot of the ESG companies are AI focused, right? So, um, and definitely. And one, I, I will adventure by saying this because I have read it time and time again. Though I cannot say for sure, but there's a lot of uh, finance study, like research being done on quantum computing. 
Um, and a lot of experts are, are saying out there that it's going to be the future of finance. I cannot name any fintech startups in Canada, at least that do use quantum computing, but uh, seems like it's going to be the tech of the future. Interesting. I like the word and uh, how the word quantum gets um, uh, into a lot of things that, uh, you know, ha may have uh, ultimately some uh, relationship with quantum physics and those things, but uh, they are somehow also in the back of my mind for other reasons. Um, but open banking is, uh, is, is an interesting topic because, uh, like Vina said a couple of times, it's where there is, um, uh, I guess the most need or, or one of the most, the, one of the directions where there is most need because, uh, there are inefficiencies in the current system, uh, and how to overcome these inefficiencies will be kind of the question to be answered, uh, by the, the FinTech, um, system or the entrepreneurs. Now, uh, what would be the hurdle there? Is that understanding, uh, how the payments work? Is that a complicated uh, thing? It's not really. Uh, taught in, uh, there's no such course as, you know, introduction to payment systems, at least in, uh, you know, university um, uh, programs, but uh, this should be uh, certainly something that um, FinTech folks should be looking at. What I could comment maybe on that is not the tech, the complexity is not the issue. I think the credibility can be the issue and that's why earlier i was uh, mentioning that a uh, fintech entrepreneur should uh, cooperate with bigger player who already have this uh, credibility and uh, could be helpful in the development of their uh, own uh, venture i see interesting yeah i i add something to that it's very like from my own personal experience as well when we look at entrepreneurs from other uh fields that are not finance a lot of them sometimes don't have a lot of, of background knowledge of the specific field. But one thing is sure is in FinTech, you do need to understand well the sector if you're gonna launch a company in the sector because there's so much regulatory roadblocks on your way. There's so much details to know and, and you're working with very important data, well, financial data. So they, they need a specific background if they're gonna start a business in FinTech. Interesting, which brings us to, uh, this is great uh, leading to question six, uh, what skills and expertise are needed to succeed in your respective, respective fields of FinTech? And you guys uh, are you know, occupying different positions in the, in the landscape, uh, but you feel free to also answer this from the perspective of other stakeholders that you uh, interact with. Uh, this is a pretty open question anyway, that for the benefit of the audience. Let's just start. Should I go? Yeah, why not? Okay, I'll go for it. Um, so I'll start to pick up on what Karina already said there. Um, your knowledge of existing system, um, especially, well, if you're looking from the finance angle, of course, there's the pure technology angle, but given my expertise, I'll talk a little bit about the finance economics angle, because that's what I have. Um, you know, law well, day is about improving existing systems. So you need to know how those systems exist, whether they're financial, you know, clearing payments, settlement systems, um, even understanding well the uh, start to finish process of an IPO. Um, then you can start to understand well where are the gridlocks, where are the bottlenecks, and then you can understand uh, where the opportunities are. But like Karina said, if if you don't really know the landscape already, it can be quite difficult. Um, of course, it's also important to understand, uh, have a little at least a working knowledge, understanding of the new technologies. For instance, blockchain. Um, you understand its strengths, its weaknesses. What are the really good use cases as well? What are not good use cases? Um, so you can see through uh, the hype. There's always a lot of hype. Um, blockchain can't solve everything, but can solve some things very well. And so it's understanding what are the uh, good use cases there. Well, 
Well, so, so we had a bit uh, of time to prepare for uh, for this question. We know it was some, something that would be of interest uh, for the the student to attend this uh, this event. So I went back to the competency framework published by the CFA Institute. Uh, it's a framework that is given for different role. So I look into the equity analysis and portfolio management um, role, and I compare that with what I uh, I live at National Bank to in the what management division, and I think it's pretty close to what we could expect from a new candidates. So financial analysis, analysis, financial modeling, data analysis and visualization are key uh, competency to develop. Uh, also, overall, there's the industry awareness, uh, the knowledge of the investment product of the world economy. Uh, when we have some uh, candidate in an interview, we want to have the field that they are in the right field. It's something that interests them and it should come to you uh, naturally to be well informed about the, the, the industry in which you want to to, to, to work in the futures. Uh, also, there's a few other points that we always look as an employer, uh, the ability for the, uh, on the communication, collaboration, curiosity, uh, emotional intelligence. We talk about of uh, IT, FinTech, but at the end of the day, you meet with some people, you must be able to connect, to exchange, and to have some interesting discussion beside the, the, the work, beside the, the, the strictly your work. So uh, those are, I think, some competencies that are, uh, should be highly regards. Very nice. Well, to work in fintech cadence, you definitely don't need a finance background. As an ex-biologist, <laughs> I didn't <laughs> learn a lot about fintech in my uh, past life. But uh, yeah, we joke around a lot with that because we are a fintech incubator. So uh, at the end of the day, we're looking mostly for individuals who are curious about the sector and want to learn more about it. It's a, it's a new sector. There's a lot to cover when you're in, in fintech. Um, so I think if you want to work in an incubator, the skill sets that are needed are mostly soft skills and, and you know, uh, PR, going to connecting with people and, 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 and networking. But we do work a lot with fintech entrepreneurs, and I think maybe that's something that's more interesting to know is like, what are the skill sets and expertise that you're needed if you want to be a fintech entrepreneur? I think my colleagues here, Bina and Jonathan already mentioned it, like knowing the field is very important. Um, it's one of the key assets to it. But I think one other thing is we are, are very adamant that uh, fintech cadence is you don't need to spread yourself too thin either. Uh, entrepreneurs are rarely building a startup alone. Most uh, startups that do succeed are composed of more than one individual. Um, and these individuals, I think the idea is behind it is trying to find that perfect team that can really like kind of uh, separate uh, their um, their skill sets. Normally, when we look at uh, general entrepreneurs, we see a lot of uh, the CEO, the CTO, and the COO, I think that's like the common ground of what we see. So like a person that's more acts on business that really knows the field, that really knows how to sell the stuff. Somebody that's more a CTO that's really focused on the tech. So of course, you're going to have to have a strong background in whatever tech you're working on. And that COO person is also that person that's going to be more in operations, more in uh, optimizing those processes. So finding that perfect team, if you uh, want to be successful as an entrepreneur, I think is one of the key to success really. So and something we often uh, preach by at Fintech Kids. Yes, wow, that's uh, that's very, very thorough. Uh, I think you guys covered everything. And I really liked uh, that um, essentially all of you mentioned the interplay between the different skills, the, the, the hard skills and the soft skills and how important those are. Uh, and it's amazing. We spend a lot of time teaching more the hard skills because we feel feels that it's it's harder to learn uh, or maybe it's just easier to teach uh, because the soft skills are not so not necessarily so easy to teach either. You know, you teach by example, but we need those uh, opportunities to uh, to be able to teach, and the best place to teach them is at uh, in the, at the workplace as well. So, um, but they're really important to be uh, for for anybody to be aware of them, and it doesn't matter which area, right? It doesn't matter if it's finance or any other area. The soft skills are so important in the workplace um, point. 
So um, very good. So uh, moving along, I'm in the interest of time, we have uh, two uh, other questions, and these are maybe a little bit, uh, you know, uh, difficult questions. You know, we wish we would have crystal balls to help us answer these questions, but because we have just a few minutes, I'm going to uh, launch them uh, in the air, and uh, whoever wants to take a stab at them, uh, we can do that, these last two questions. So starting with question seven. Despite the big hype, are crypto assets suitable as investments? And as the industry evolves, what is likely to happen to the fintech stock? So there are two questions here. One about the crypto assets, maybe cryptocurrencies, these are bitcoins and the other versions of it. Uh, and then on the other hand, the fintech industry, the sectors, they are, um, you know, they're like um, a, you know, an ecosystem that it's in full development. So what is going to happen with uh, the stock of these companies as the system evolves. Uh, if only we had crystal balls. Um, I'm happy to take a stand on this one, though. Uh, I both like and dislike the way it's asked because uh, we kind of take for granted that crypto are necessarily stocks and not just currencies. Because um, I, if we take a step back, when cryptos, the first crypto that was created was was Bitcoin, and it was essentially supposed to be a digital currency, and that was its main goal, uh, without having a sort of a middleman, which in most times is a financial institution. Um, but yeah, I think in, in in an economy like in Canada, where we have a very stable currency, uh, a lot of people do see cryptocurrencies more as a stock than as a currency. Um, and it's and a lot of people though do hold this stock. And I was looking at a bit of stats recently, and KPMG uh, pulled out that 13% of Canadians have purchased a currency, a cryptocurrency, um, which is, I mean, for me, is insane. It's a lot of people. <laughs> uh, most of these, most of of uh, people that have acquired cryptocurrencies are very young, under uh, 30 years old. So um, it, it's 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 to say how younger generations are seeing this asset. Um, but also, I think it's interesting to see like the, the, the disproportion of how we see crypto assets here in Canada versus other countries. Um, if we look at, because a lot of people criticize uh, cryptocurrencies because they say that they fluctuate a lot, which is true uh, if you compare them with US dollar and Canadian dollar. But for certain economies where their currencies do like, fluctuate a lot, cryptocurrencies can actually be an alternative to uh, payments. And in certain countries, they actually do use cryptocurrencies much more than we could expect. Some of them are using cryptocurrencies as, as everyday transactions. So that's uh, clearly a use uh, that is not there to uh, disappear. Also, when we're looking at people that are, are doing uh, exchange of money from country to country, the exchange fees are often very expensive, sometimes can go up to 9% of whatever you're exchanging. Uh, cryptocurrencies have the advantage of, of having smaller exchange fees in those specific cases for uh, a lot of people. I think we saw it with the war in Ukraine. A lot of people were sending crypto investments because, uh, to Ukraine as, a, as funding because it was cheaper than sending uh, through normal payment systems. Uh, even Canada Helps, which is a company that supports uh, Canadian charities, is now accepting crypto uh, as, a, as, charity, as charity money. Um, and then we're seeing big players in in the system that are that are clearly taking a stand pro crypto, like Visa, PayPal, even Tesla, of course, are are facilitating and and uh, the exchange of of, uh, of crypto as as uh, as um, a currency. So, not to say that people should or shouldn't invest. I I will never say such a thing. Uh, but. I think that there are clearly usage, um, so I don't think that we're going to see the disappearance of crypto assets anytime soon. Don't think they will ever replace uh, crypto uh, currencies in, in in stable economies, but clearly they have a use uh, in other countries. Um, and yeah, if you're going to invest in this stock, um, do do your due deal, learn about it. Don't take any of your personal money if you don't have any. To invest in those in those currencies, uh, I think that's the only last uh, advice I could give before before maybe giving the mic to anybody else. Thank you, Karim. I'd like to take this question on an uh, investment uh, uh, basis. Uh, first, I have a disclaimer: uh, this will not constitute some uh, financial advice, and I uh, invite you to uh, to meet with a financial advisor. Uh, but um, I think the fintech industry as a whole 
is will thrive for sure it will be a, a success it's a, a new way of doing things the problems the problem all come up to picking winners uh, you must be very careful uh, i like to when i talk with some friends or some uh, family I like to dis to distinguish between investment and speculation. At this point, I think there's a lot of uh, stock or cryptocurrencies that I would class under the speculation uh, bucket. Uh, you must be very careful. The key in investment is having a diversified portfolio. And by this diversify, I don't mean 10 different cryptocurrency. It should be one part of your portfolio. Uh, we do some benchmarking at National Bank with other major institutions. And a lot of time, the allocation that is recommended when, when it is, is around three to five percent of your portfolio it may seem very conservative the industry is uh, conservative by nature but i would invite you to the utmost uh, prudency in that field absolutely so i'm glad to hear that because that's really how i think as well and um uh, i'm you know i, I think it's really uh, weird that if you don't understand uh, whose liability this is when you buy an asset uh, because you know an asset is you know for someone is always going to be a liability for for someone else even currency you know it's liability for the central bank so uh, you have to uh, to understand how this works in order to uh, to invest in these things yeah and you must keep in mind also that the regulator can come up and close the whole industry for example Perfect. for cryptocurrency overnight so uh... Well, speaking of which, this leads us to the last question is uh, once a complete regulatory framework is in place in most developed economies, what might happen with uh, these markets and uh, and what we're talking about? So I think you already said something that could happen, which is maybe a you know cataclysmic type of um, uh, event, but it could very well happen. It could wipe out at least uh, parts of an industry that didn't really fit with anything that would essentially makes sense so i will welcome any comments on this last question on a voluntary basis uh and then we can open uh also for the uh for the audience uh if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question please use the chat function while we talk about this last one so what do you guys think will it disappear what else will appear it's hard to know it's it's so hard to know. We don't have a crystal ball. Like, it, the technologies do come and go. Sometimes they stay for a long time. Sometimes they come back. Uh, you know, um, I think if if we're talking specifically about cryptocurrencies, they have a whole bunch of usage that are not necessarily specific to uh, just like uh, money. So, I you know. I, like tokenization will become a thing. So maybe they'll be used in other types. Maybe they'll be used as currency in the metaverse. Like who knows? Like there's so much, there's so much happening. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a stand on this one. <laughs> well, we can leave this as just food for thought for the audience too, because I think we should consider these questions, even if we, if we can answer them, just so that we are more careful, as you all said, uh, what we do with, uh, with our investments, our money, and with our clients uh investments as well so with that uh i will open the floor for questions um and i haven't seen any in the chat yet i could be wrong i'm not i may i'm not sure if i'm looking at the right spot um while i don't receive any questions i just wanted to uh just uh have a few reminders uh if you have registered for this uh workshop uh, you will be receiving an email with the link to the recording and we will also include a link to uh, for you to participate in a survey that McGill University is conducting. Um, oh, I see that some people wrote questions on the Q&A. Okay, I will address them. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so we will receive an email with the link to the survey and please participate in the survey. We are collecting information from people who are interested in fintech, who may be working in the fintech industry or have an interest in working in the fintech industry to um, uh, have an assessment of the needs in, for, uh, for an education program in fintech 
uh, in our community so that McGill University can develop a program appropriately to these needs. Um, so that's one of the things that I'd like to uh, mention here to the audience that uh, look out for this link for the survey and please participate in the survey. Uh, also, in about a week time, in a, exactly a week's time, uh, we are going to have an information session on our main uh, finance programming at the School of Continuing Studies at McGill, the Diploma in Professional Practice in Finance, which is an affiliated uh, program with the, with the CFA Institute. So, uh, there's an inform information session coming up uh, at 6 p.m. next Wednesday. And also another uh, very small announcement, you know, st uh, stay tuned for, um, you know, very soon information on the CFA workshop, my CFA workshop uh, that we are going to be offers, uh, returning offering to for the 2023 uh, CFA exam. So uh, the information is not out yet, but in the next uh, week or two, it should be uh, starting to come out and, um, and that should be a very interesting uh, program as well. So let me see if I can go in the I'll stop sharing here so I can get a little bit more control of what's going on. And I need to look at the Q and A session. If anybody can help me, I know that Paula uh, from the team is here to, and perhaps she can help with those questions. Yeah, I'm trying to look for questions. The Q and A too, Eduardo. <laughs> I, don't know I just found it. Knows. I just found it. I have one question. I may, yes. might uh, read it for everyone. So, how vulnerable do you feel that the field is to the whim of tech giants like Apple and Google? Recently, read about Google planning to issue single use credit card numbers for safe online payment. Can moves like that make some fintech companies fold? That's a very interesting question because I think even on the on the cryptocurrencies, uh, Facebook is you know is one that has been uh, in this space for a long time. You know, trying to come up with these solutions where uh, the fear is that ultimately you know what's going to happen if they just dominate the whole world. You know, with the you know the currency is now a Facebook currency. It's kind of very weird. So, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I like to I like to maybe uh, jump in on that. Uh, it's something that I think we've noticed a lot uh, when we look at fintech in general. I think at fintech we we do see that there are some like big trends of who is leading the market, and one of the I wouldn't say like uh, scaries, but like one of the, the the things that we're seeing and it is true is we call them the tech fins. So like the the big tech companies that are bringing in financial solutions, they're very. They're very, they're very scary to the market, meaning they already have a big, uh, a big base of customers that are very, sometimes see them as godly companies. Um, and they are, they have access to much more tech. And so like, they can easily take the space of small tech players. Now, I don't want to, I want to go up to there, but I do think that even for financial institutions, these tech fans can be uh, scary. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I'll stop to that. I'll just say that. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier, I was referring to the fact that the uh, main issues was not the tech complexity, but the credibility. Uh, when you talk about Apple, Google, they have the credibility from the general public. So, I, I guess financial institution and all other fintech organization might be a lot more worried about those player, mega player to enter the field than uh, any other one. <laughs> so uh, I think they, they might, if they decide to get into the financial industry, be some major player, but it all comes up to the fact, do they want to uh, meet with all those compliance and regulatory uh, uh, requirements? I think some do because of all the data that's behind the financial data. But I think that's also scary from a consumer standpoint is personally, I know that these companies already have so much data about myself. Um, you know, Google knows all the things like Google, Apple, my computer is an Apple. So a lot of information goes through that. If these giants also had information about my financial transactions, that makes a lot of information they have on each people. And, you know, can we really trust corporations? Are there like, you know, can we really trust them? It's it's always it's always that that scary aspect to it. I I might be a bit paranoid, but personally, I have a bit of fear. Yeah, no, I I, I don't blame you. 
Uh, that's a very good question, though. Uh, there's another question here. Will McGill be offering courses on fintech cryptocurrencies? Uh, the short answer is yes, uh, but we are actually still trying to figure out what the best format for these courses. So that's why we are uh, launching the survey. So, as I said, you know, look out for the email where you have the link to the survey and please answer it. So we will, we will do that. Specific program that can help us to analyze data. For sure, there is uh, data, you know, all kinds of data uh, science type of uh, education programs that you are welcome to look into uh, the, 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 the McGill uh, portfolio of, of programs. But feel free also to reach out uh, directly to, uh, to myself. I guess what I'll do is I will put my uh, email address in the chat box. And if anybody would like to ask any questions about McGill, Elisa is also answering some questions. Elisa is the uh, director and coordinator for the technology uh, programs. And Paula also sharing uh, links here. So I'm very well assisted. Thank you. Yes. Um, I realize we are just a couple of minutes past seven o'clock. Uh, we didn't have a lot of questions from the audience, but I think we had pretty good questions that we kind of uh, created from the start. And uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, and certainly lively discussion. I'd like to once again thank the panelists, uh, Bina, Jonathan, Karina, for your participation, for your time. It's very generous of yours, and I really appreciate your um, um, engagement with uh, with uh, you know any education efforts that we are trying to uh, establish here. So once again, thank you very much uh, for your participation, your time. I'd like to thank the audience for uh, their attention and participation as well, and their presence and uh, for the uh, administration and uh, technical people at McGill for making this possible as well. Have a great night, everybody, and uh, thanks once again. Thank you. Have a nice evening. As will be finishing.